Yeah, good morning and thanks for having me. Um, it's a keynote, but I promise it will be a short one. And as it is a short one, I will concentrate on two challenges transnational companies and their compliance officers are facing and discussing quite a lot and on two trends we observe. And let me start with a little summary of what I will be talking about, and that is compliance is dead, at least almost. Um, if we look at compliance programs, law and, and norms based, they all failed. And the large and never ending list of scandals, corruption scandals we're reading about in the newspapers is a very good indicator. Uh, they may eventually, if you're lucky, keep you out of jail, but they don't protect the organization, they don't protect you against the many and very, very damaging uh, consequences you are facing, being them regulatories, being them legal, financial, or reputational. So they are mechanisms, they are tools. They may be more or less sophisticated, but their output depends on their input, and the input is human behavior. And human behavior, fortunately or unfortunately, is complex. And our law enforcement tools are not adequate, adequate to deal with these challenges. Um, you know all this chart. It has been cited today and, and yesterday, I think, as well. Transparency International publishes it every year. It's sort of boring because it doesn't change a lot. Um, but nevertheless, it's, it's impressive, even though Transparency International, of course, isn't able to measure exact corruption levels in countries. Uh, nobody will ask, uh, will answer the question, how much did you pay in bribes last year? And how much are you planning to, to, to pay next year? But if you look at it, unless you live in one of the few yellow countries, uh, mainly Finland, Denmark, New Zealand and Canada, you have to deal with the issue. And if you are living in one of the orange uh, or red or deep red countries, then you will have to deal with corruption almost on a daily basis. And transnational companies are doing business almost everywhere. So they have to find a way to get around with it. When I ask in my uh, executive education classes, participants, how their companies performed over the last year in South America, I get answers ranging from acceptable to excellent. And when I follow up with the question, well, and how did you achieve these results in this complex environment? I get silence for whatever reason. Uh, maybe they don't trust their compliance programs to be effective, or they don't know, or they don't want to know what's happening quite a lot, or they think they are cosmetic. And if they are cosmetic, they are dead. So it's no wonder that Professor Herr Schäfrin, who's one of the founding fathers of behavioral economics and behavioral risk, says in every major risk management disaster, and all the corruption scandals are risk management disasters, of the last 15 years, the problem has not been a technical issue, but a psychological one. And international companies know that. They all have their compliance program, and most of them already had their scandals, and the rest of them probably will have it in the near or farther future. And regulators know it as well. The Department of Justice and the SEC, the most active regulators and the ones who are leading the field, uh, know it and amended their requirements for the effectiveness of compliance programs. And this is followed very closely by transnational companies because only if the compliance program is considered by them as effective 
it has mitigating effects in an incident. And transnational companies, we saw that on the, on the chart by Trans, uh, Transparency International, are doing business everywhere. They don't want a minor incident in a marginal market to fall on their head in the States or Great Britain or any other company, uh, country. So they all have implemented more or less sophisticated um, compliance programs, and they adapted them to the new, or not so new, requirements being ethics, one of the fundamental part of their compliance program. So how do they look? All these programs look similar. They are all designed around the seven pillars uh, established by the federal sentencing guidelines, and they vary by special risks of the different business sectors of the different countries, the business models. They vary by the maturity of the program, and they seem to be affected by the company's history. Companies who already went through a major scandal seem to be more committed to an effective compliance program. The enormous legal, financial, and especially organizational damages uh, they suffered uh, are so big they do everything possible to avoid uh, repetition. So uh, they, in our observation, uh, dedicate more resources and higher qualified resources to their efforts. Let's um, come now to the two challenges. The first is risk mapping. Risk mapping, not uh, general risk mapping, every company does, but risk mapping of ethics and compliance risks. They are required by the regulators. In order to have an effective compliance program, you need to start with the uh, ethics and compliance risk mapping. They, up to now, not really have requirements how you have to do that, but they started asking you which procedure the company has used for it. But it's not the only reason for having um, ethics and compliance risk mapping. If you have one, you are able to focus better your resources uh, where they are needed, and you don't spread them evenly, but ineffectively across the whole organization. And the third point is leadership commitment. Um, performing a risk management, uh, a risk mapping of ethics and compliance risks is an excellent indicator for the whole organization that the leadership is taking the problem seriously and not only um, reading and rereading nice words from their code of conduct. So it uh, brings awareness to the whole organization and sets uh, the tone at the top right. Unfortunately, performing these risk mapping processes is challenging for companies. They are not used to it because uh, they include risks they normally don't measure and which are difficult to measure, maybe impossible to measure. How do you measure an ethical organization? How do you measure the risk of a determined uh, leadership style? So everybody tries it. Uh, not too many do it well, but uh, they are looking at it because they are looking forward and expect that regulators in the near or further future will have some requirements on regarding how to do that. So the second um, challenge lies in the value chain. Um, it's eventually the most important, or one of the most important and uh, complex anti-corruption topics. If you look as, at the DOJ and SEC um, investigations over the last years, most of them involve third parties. And companies, transnational companies, rely on third parties. The value chain is long and complex. Unfortunately, outsourcing activities doesn't outsource the legal, financial, and reputational risks. Um, so surprisingly, 70% of them 
ignore corruption in their supply chain. That at least is what a survey by The Economist some years ago showed. That doesn't mean, of course, that 70% are corrupt, but it means that 70% don't have the slightest idea what's happening in their supply chain. And on the other hand, surprisingly as well, or not so surprisingly, third party compliance obligations are popping up in code of conduct. And uh, some companies even have a special code of conduct for their supply chain. That may look like an advanced practice, but it's not. It's not enough. The promise to behave well is not enough. Regulators ask companies to monitor and control their supply chain regarding their compliance duties. Um, at the end, you can compare it to what happened to quality assurance many years ago. Historically, um, the quality of products was controlled upon arrival at the factory gate. Uh, that's for many years already not any longer the case, and companies control processes in their suppliers and suppliers of suppliers organization. And the same will happen with compliance processes. So how should companies deal with it? Um, the most effective ways to address third-party compliance is start with an initial due diligence, uh, routinely monitor your, su your supply chain, have audit rights, we, I'll come back to that in a minute, uh, termination rights in case of violations, and training and communication of executives and employees in third party companies and flow down. Flow down is a nice word. It means imposing your code of conduct in the supply chain to your suppliers and suppliers of suppliers and suppliers of the suppliers of the suppliers. Um, audit rights, one of the difficult things. In, in an informal show of hands, asking compliance officers if their companies have compliance provisions in their code of conduct, 80% at the conference at IAE Business School, 80% uh, of them raised their hand and said, yes, we have that. And a similar percentage said, yes, we have audit rights in these provisions. But when I asked them if they exercised these audit rights, not even 10% said they have done so. So why do we have them? Maybe they are cosmetic. We are coming back to compliance is dead. Or look at flow down. Uh, that uh, is easy and, and sounds logical if you have two or three suppliers and one distributor, but you don't have that. You are dealing with thousands of, or tens of thousands of uh, suppliers, outsourced uh, service uh, providers, and many distribution uh, channels. And by the way, everybody is part of I don't know how many supply chains. So now imagine you are like a spider in a, red, in a net and you are facing contradicting compliance demands from all over the place, from suppliers, from customers. How do you deal with that? You can't. Thousands of codes of conduct reigning in every day. If you're a big company, most probably you have processes for that. You establish standards for clauses which are always acceptable, which are always non-acceptable, and escalation process for sensible, sensible clauses. But if you're not a big company, and in many emerging countries you are working with uh, local companies who don't have these resources, what will the consequence be? Where do I have to sign? It's a pure formality. So, and... Even worse, imagine you are a local company and you try to discuss with a huge transnational company a clause. Ha! That's a difficult task, I tell you. They will not accept that. Hmm? But what is, better? what is better, somebody who tries to discuss a clause or somebody who says, where do we have to sign in order to stay in business? So that's sort of another challenge. And coming to the trends, um, Preparing this little speech, um, we asked compliance officers of international companies 
in the southern part of South America. What has changed over the last years in their compliance programs? And 77% told us the importance of our, of their anti-corruption programs has improved. And 77% said as well that they count now with an increasingly and very strong board commitment and asked for the reasons for these improvements. They said it's culture and it's training. It's not rules and it's not regulations. And asked for the three most important aspects of their compliance programs. They said it's culture. It's culture, because tone at the top is culture. And it's training. I don't like the word, but it doesn't matter, training. Mm -hmm. So asking them, um, compliance officers in international surveys, we find the same line of evolution. Compliance officers are on the rise in the corporate governance landscapes. Now, 30% report to the CEO or the audit committee. And very importantly, almost half of them take part in strategic decisions of the company, which gives them a better overview over the general risk in the company and the possibility to voice concerns regarding changed business models or changed business. So 50% meet with the CEO on a monthly basis and 60% report on the compliance program to the board at least quarterly, which ensures that the higher escalons of the companies know what's the actual situation, not only of incidents, but of the compliance system uh, in, at all. So there we find two trends from many, many surveys. One is culture and behavior driven ethics and compliance programs are coming up and they are more based on principles, of course, than on rules and regulations. So they most probably will evolve to behavioral compliance and be helped by new technologies. Digitalization isn't an evolution you can't exclude from uh, legal-dominated uh, uh, professions like compliance, big data, data analytics, artificial intelligence and automation, and one day, most probably, blockchain as well. They will influence a lot the work uh, and the way compliance officers perform their activities. So what can be expected? Results suggest that ethics and compliance programs will be more based on culture and behavior, less incentive-driven, legally oriented and punitive. We are sort of seeing um, redefinition for compliance. Instead of compliance means compliance with internal and external rules and regulations, it's more the answer to the question, how do I achieve that my people make good decisions in difficult situations? And if that is the definition of compliance, um, it's about decision making. And it's about principles. And it's about leadership. And we all know the huge leadership problems and failures um, which fall where the, 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 the origin of many of the corruption scandals over the last years. So whom are compliance programs targeting now in big companies? Um, they are not targeting the few angels we find in any and every organization. They, they don't know, they don't need compliance. They will behave well anyhow. And uh, they don't target the devils because they are sort of compliance resistant. Um, they target the huge amount of people being executives and employees who are good people, who want to be good people, but need help and support to stay the course in difficult situation, being them temptations or extortion. 
So um, it confirms compliance is only a tool. The input is human, and humans, we all are humans, um, we are vulnerable. Um, and to be effective, the programs and the companies put stronger focus on the imperfect parts and not the already sophisticated, automated tools the present uh, compliance programs are. So it's about culture. The results of the respondents are clear. Uh, higher board commitment that shows very clearly how the uh, boards now have the, the issue on the table, and they are the ones who determine the culture of the company. Culture is built up not from the bottom, but from the top. Education has changed a lot over the last years, um, and that's good news. I don't know if any of you have had the enormous pleasure of being exposed to a traditional compliance training. It's the most boring thing you can imagine. And it's not only boring, it's totally ineffective because um, whatever you have listened to, you will have forgotten five minutes later. Um, the new, or not so new, uh, education, which is, I think, the better term uh, for these effort efforts, um, are dilemma-based. They are discussion-based, they are participative, and they admit that companies many times operate in gray areas, which are difficult to, to solve and where we don't have one correct solution. So that fosters a culture of transparency in the company and a speak-up speak culture, which is important as well for preventing corruption. So that is one aspect. The other aspect is psychological. Every time we see more use of insights from cognitive sciences. And that's good because companies look beyond and uh, beyond compliance and embrace slowly, but they embrace behavioral compliance, which is less prone to be cosmetic because check the boxes processes don't fit in when we are focusing on human behavior. And that offers hope, hope that companies will not only be compliant, but as all of them tell us in their codes of conduct and mission statements, compliant and ethical. And that contributes to the premise of compliance, with which at the end is prevention. Um, and the second trend is the use of new technologies. Even though surveys show that uh, many companies are behind the technological curve in the use of new technologies, in their compliance works. Uh, they are wrestling with huge amount of data, disconnected system, it's a mess. Many are still relying on Excel data. So it's no wonder that these buzzwords, big data, data analytics, automation, artificial intelligence, are very much discussed topics in the compliance community. Um, even our regional survey 80% of compliance officers said that they expect these new technologies having a huge impact on their work. So that's sort of a complementary trend in the evolving compliance um, profession because big data and data analytics allows for better targeting um, people to monitor, situations to monitor, risks to monitor, and to target the people you, who need specialized, tailored education. Coming to an end, compliance isn't what it was to be. To be. It's dead. It started with a legal approach, which was ineffective. Then they added ethics. And uh, after ethics, they're now using behavioral insights. So. Compliance isn't any longer the correct definition for the efforts companies and compliance officers are pursuing. That's why companies not only renamed their area, integrity or ethics and compliance, compliance and ethics, whatever combination of nice words you like to choose, they focus, 
the program, <coughs> not any longer from a legal perspective. Um, and let me end with a very final thought. I think transnational companies have a special obligation. They are operating in many emerging markets with many suppliers and business partners who are local companies, which are local companies, big, medium-sized or small ones. And transnational companies have the financial shoulders to say no. Many local companies don't have these shoulders. And I think there's at least a moral obligation for transnational companies to provide for these local companies a safe harbor to make business and to help and support them to stay the course in difficult situations. So I know many do so, and I wish many more will follow. Many thanks. Thank you very, very much for this talk.